Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's web seminar, Jumpstart Your Business, Part 3, The Financial Plan. My name is Laura Haight, and I am the managing partner at Portfolio Communications. I will be your moderator today. We at Portfolio are very excited to be working with the SBDC to bring you this on-demand presentation of the Jumpstart series and other web-delivered events. This is the last of a three-part series of events that focus on preparing you to start your business. Part one, address the question of whether you are ready, personally, professionally, and financially, to start a business. Part two is a very hands-on workshop on building a business plan. Today's presentation is another hands-on presentation designed to get you comfortable with your financials. Evidence shows that many businesses fail because they either do not read or do not understand their financial statements. The inability to forecast and predict cash flow is a major contributor to the high failure rate for small businesses, and that's something this session is designed to help you avoid. The Small Business Development Center is dedicated to helping small businesses and entrepreneurs like you to start, grow, and thrive. You'll hear more about the services you as an entrepreneur have access to during the presentation. The presenter today is Scott Welshell, the area manager and a business consultant for the Greenville area SBDC. There will be Q&A sessions throughout the presentation. At the end of the webinar, your browser will be directed to a web page where you can download relevant documents and also find additional links to information and resources. So now on to our program with Scott Welshell, taking us through a detailed session on researching and preparing and understanding your financials. Scott, welcome. Thank you, Laura. We'll jump right in and cover the first session in today's presentation. And just to highlight a few things coming up, this is session three following on the tales of session two, which dealt with the the bulk of the narrative content for the business plan. The final piece element in the business plan that we'll be covering today deals with the financial aspects to include. And we should highlight the pertinent financial projections, the statements that are required for basic business plan preparation in order to communicate your financial need and your financial goals to those who are sharing your business plan with. We'll also look at some basics of commercial lending, understanding a little bit about the, the business loan market in America today and look, look at other sources of capital and hit some of the highlights for some of the, the practical day-to-day -day issues such as licensing requirements and a few of the regulatory issues that you face as you begin to work down that final checklist to open the doors of a business. We concluded our business plan outline in session two with part nine and now with part eight rather, part nine is entitled the financial plan. As, as Laura said in the introduction, it's very important that a business owner be responsible for and competent in understanding their basic financial statements. It doesn't mean that an MBA or a four-year accounting degree is required to own, to own and operate a business successfully. However, there really are just a handful of things that you need to be able to communicate about with lenders, investors, regulators, and others as you grow and operate a business. Some of the basic elements from a financial perspective that are needed in a business plan include a statement of sources and uses of funds, basic projections for cash flow, profit and loss, and balance sheets, summary, summary information for a loan, determining some of the, the criteria you, you would need, how to communicate to a lender that, that you do have an adequate credit score, that you do have adequate collateral covered, that you have adequate insurance as well, all kind of fall under the loan information section. Understanding the type of capital equipment you need, when the funding is needed, how long the equipment will last. The business plan also should address in the financial section some key ratios, understanding some industry benchmarks that are relevant for you and the business you anticipate launching, and very often a break-even analysis as well. We'll hit some of these in much more detail as we walk through the slides. And the first of these is covering sources and uses of funds. This basically is building, it's turning your startup budget, your best guess at what it will take to 
to operate the business, to launch, to go from where you are today to day one, opening the business, delivering goods or services to a customer. You're obviously the sources and uses are two major categories. Sources of funds is where the money comes from. Uses of funds is where it goes. So the uses of funds would look like your startup budget. You may need to, if you're planning to purchase land and building, that's a major use of funds. If you're planning to purchase equipment and machinery, if you're planning to purchase inventory, you know, computers, technology, you know, promotional items, et cetera, those are all uses of funds. Sources of funds would be where the money comes from. Is it from the investments of the owner, investments of other owners as well? Is there debt in the form of a loan from a business or lender? So basically the sources and uses, in any case, where you're communicating to a potential lender or potential investor, they not only want to understand that you know understand, they want to know that you know how the business will work. They also want to understand if I'm putting my money in your business, what exactly am I helping you to, to accomplish? So by preparing sources and uses, you can communicate to one lender that yes, to the bank, we are using this money from you to purchase the real estate, then to another lender or investor your funds will be used to purchase equipment so they understand how they're, the role that each plays in helping you to operate the business. Cash flow analysis is the most important element in financial understanding for a new business. And we'll cover it fairly quickly, but essentially walking through the mathematics of it, your, your cash flow for, any, for a given period of time, such as a, a month, a week, or a year, begins with cash on hand, your available cash balance. Add all the, all the cash received, collections, deposits in the account, cash in the register, and then subtract all the cash disbursements. Money you paid to employees, debt you service through payments to the bank or lender, rent that was paid, payroll to the employees, inventory purchases to, the, to your vendors. The net that's left is the cash flow for that month. If you add your net flow to your opening balance, that is your new cash position. So essentially, if you have $100 in your bank account when you open the, the month, you sell $10,000 worth of product and, and receive payment for and make deposits for $10,000 and then disperse a total of 8000 to your vendors, to your employees, to your landlord, to your bank, the net flow for that month is the remaining 2000 and your new cash position at the end of the month is 2000 plus the 100 you started with. A very key element here, which we allude to by the notes about accounts receivable and collection times, and this is where many, many new businesses fail to really consider the financial implications of and the, the timing aspect of a business. Just because you make a sale doesn't mean you actually make money. It's important to address you know, when when do you begin to expend money to buy the inventory to create the, the product or deliver the good or service in comparison with when you make a deposit. When does the customer pay you? Do they pay you a deposit? Do they pay you in full up front? Do they make a partial payment up front and a partial payment at delivery? Or will they pay you in 60 to 90 days per their terms and conditions? Or will they pay you whenever they feel like it? And, and that's unfortunately happens more and more often, and small businesses generally are least able to deal with the, the consequences caused by slow payments or late payments or miscalculated payments. So it's the topic that we, we really stress over and over, developing the initial cash flow projections. And a profit and loss forecast is similar. However, instead of dealing with just receipts and, expense and expenditures, the cash in and cash out of a cash flow statement, the profit and loss or income statement is based on gross sales, build sales written up whether collected or not. The sales minus the cost of the goods sold or the direct cost of labor yields a gross profit number. The gross profit is the actual money available to pay labor expenses, other operating expenses as well, to generate a net profit before taxes, and of course, taxes come into play at that point. The balance sheet is the third of the three financial statements. 
that every business owner needs to have some basic understanding of and be able to communicate what they see there to lenders or investors. While the cash flow statement and the profit loss statement show changes over the course of, of a period of time, such as transactions within a month or a week or a quarter or a year, the balance sheet is truly a snapshot of your business financial condition on a specific day. At one point in time, the balance sheet shows the assets in the business as of today, as of December 31st, as of end of the fiscal year, whatever that one point in time is. It also shows the total liabilities owed by the business at that same date and the owner's equity left in the business. The assets of the business include things like cash, inventory, plant and fixtures and equipment, vehicles, uh, deposits, prepaid items, money owed to the business, accounts receivable is an example of an asset of the business. Liabilities of a business include just that liabilities or debts, obligations, payroll that has been accrued to employees but has not been paid yet, uh, debts owed to banks, lenders, and others, and owner's equity includes several elements, often the initial purchase equity, the initial paid in capital of the business, the, the money invested at day one when the business is opened, as well as retained earnings over time. So finally we get to part section 10 of the business plan. The last of the business plan elements simply is an appendix. Obviously it's not a very creative name, but this in essence is the place where you put all the other things we talked about that didn't fit into a paragraph or two discussion. Common elements included in the appendix Maybe background data from the borrowers, from the business owners, in terms of tax returns, credit reports, resumes, serious technical information. If there's a 50 or 70 or 100 page report or market research study or statement of the industry published by a trade group that you consulted with or a consultant you contracted with directly, that's the kind of information that doesn't need to be you know, printed every time you print a business plan, make it available in an, in an appendix. So that if someone really needs the detailed information, if a lender or a investor or business partner is going to make a serious effort to research the business, they can then find out that you've done your homework and hopefully that information goes to support your projections and the rest of the information in the business plan. That wraps up the first section. And at this point, we'll entertain some questions. Okay, Scott. We've got a few here. Um, that was a lot of elements. Can you describe a little bit how they're all going to fit into the business plan? Do they get scattered throughout? Do they all get put into one section, or, or do they make up an appendix? That's a good question, and the answer could be a little bit of each. At a very high level, the basic elements that were listed in the earlier slide are scattered throughout the business plan. Even, the, even the, an executive summary should give some indication of the projected gross sales within the first year or two or three. At the early in the, the business plan, either in the summary or in the a statement of the current situation or financing salt, your sources and uses of funds may be inserted and briefly described through one paragraph, just a few sentences, to restate, here's the capital need. We are seeking 80% of the cost of land and building, which equals a loan, uh, which we anticipate in the form of a loan from lender ABC. However, you don't need to necessarily include every single detail from the startup budget in the narrative of the plan. So I would generally say if you have fairly comprehensive financial statements, financial projections that you have prepared as, through your research process to launch the business. Definitely include them in an appendix. However, you don't be afraid to, to reference those to provide pertinent information throughout the content of the plan, throughout the text of the narrative, so that you can begin to communicate that you understand 
the financial position of the business. You understand what you need and when and why. Okay, good. Um, this is probably a picky question, but is there just one appendix, or could there be more than one for one for financial data, another for market research, another for product specifications? What are your thoughts on that? That's not horribly picky, but it is it is a good question. We just reference one section, Roman numeral ten for an appendix, but at that point it, it could very well be a series of appendices that include yeah, Appendix A, financial data, Appendix B, background information for owners, tax returns, financial statements, those things, Appendix C, market research, Appendix D may be commercial appraisals for the property that you're trying to buy, Appendix E or F may be um, detailed financial projections for the business, providing a full three years or five years of, of cash flow and profit and loss statements. So there, we use the term appendix somewhat generically, but it may in fact be a series of, of several specific appendices that are attached at the end of the plan. Okay. Um, another formatting question. If uh, if you build the financial statements in a spreadsheet, can you insert that into a plan after it's printed, or does it need to be uh, cut and pasted into a document as a picture or, or a table, assuming that you were dealing with Word and Excel? Okay, and, and I do very much work with Word and Excel. And again, I don't know if there's necessarily one magic format, one magic formula for, for that would apply to every business plan. However, I tend to treat the document, the narrative form of the plan, separate from the financial projections in my work. That's because I, under, I work in Excel for the numbers, book and word or the word processing document, uh, system management for the, the, the narrative text of the plan. So in my experience, it's worked fairly well to keep the two separate, just print and insert at the appropriate place, or keep the financial separate from the plan you can always reference them and, and provide a few basic highlights the course of a sentence or two. At the end of the first quarter, we anticipate gross revenue of X. By the end of the first year, gross revenues of Y. You can certainly include that into a brief narrative overview of the financial statements and then just attach the data later. So I tend to keep them separate as much as possible. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions we have on this section, Scott. So if you want to move forward. Okay, we will. Let's move on to the second section for to review some basics for financing for your business. And the cartoon here we provide just maybe it references a, an era gone by, bygone days where someone would would ask for funding, would you know solicit venture capital, angel investment with a request as silly as needing $80 million to develop the plan of a concept, of a vision, of the seed of an idea. If that is your strategy, let me advise you that uh, things have changed, and we need to be much more specific, much more clear and concise and relevant. We'll jump right into commercial lending. It's one of the, the traditional primary avenues for seeking funding for new business or any small business. Uh, commercial lending includes banks and non-bank lenders. In the bank world, there are commercial loans, commercial lines of credit, could be a commercial mortgage, or even an auto loan to a commercial entity, to a business entity. The Small Business Administration, SBA loan programs have been around for a number of years. Some lenders use them with great regularity and much success. Some lenders don't use them at all. That's purely a bank decision. However, there are also non-bank lenders that we want to touch on briefly to encourage people to, to not take a no from their personal bank to mean that, no, there is no way to get a loan financed. That might just mean it's not the right time, not the right project, not the right deal for that lender, for that bank. In, in the area of non-bank lenders, many of these do use SBA guaranteed loan programs. Some use rural development loans, which is a, operated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the USDA, has 
a similar structure of providing repayment guarantees or collateral guarantees to loans that are targeted to uh, specific geographic areas. Most parts of South Carolina are eligible for USDA rural development loans, with, with the exception of a few of the larger cities. But that's certainly something to consider, particularly if you aren't inside a, local, a relatively large city. Another element of, and a growing element of non-bank lenders would include micro lenders or community, community development loan programs. These may be operated by a city or county government. It may be operated by a, a quasi-governmental lending organization or they may even be operated by a nonprofit organization or an a, a independent business or quasi-business entity. In South Carolina, there are a number of microloans or community development loan programs that have come, come into existence in the last five years. I can thinking just here in the upstate, there are four or five that I'm aware of that do make small business loans. And typically, the emphasis on small there, there may be loans in the range of five to 50 or even $100,000 but those transactions, for one reason or another, typically don't fit into the type of lending, the type of loan structure that local banks are prepared to meet on a regular basis. If you are pursuing traditional financing, uh, think bank loan or even a, a commercial loan from a non-bank lender, just because the loan program might be guaranteed by the Small Business Administration or the USDA does not mean that your credit doesn't matter, it doesn't mean you don't have to have collateral, it just means that there is a secondary source of payment or even a tertiary source of payment provided through the loans through the government to guarantee the loan to provide a little, a little extra comfort to the lender. This is slide now here you see before you, recaps the five C's of credit. There's no, I can't claim to, to, to copyright this. Five C's of credit has been around for a number a long time and basically highlights in a fairly easy to understand area five different elements to consider when preparing a loan request and this is to just to remind everyone that it's typically not one thing that causes a loan to not be successful uh, your credit matters your your history your management experience in the business matters in every case, if a bank is involved, they want to see that you make, you the owner, make some personal investment. You have some stake in the business. You've got your cash at risk, just like you asked them to put theirs at risk. The capacity, we talked about cash flow, the importance of cash flow in the beginning. The capacity is all about showing that the business has a sound basis for projecting more than enough money every month to pay the, to service all the debt, as well as other bills. Collateral is the security behind a loan. It's typically, in the case of land and building, it's a, you know, the bank is going to hold a lien, lien against the property. They hold the deed until the loan is paid off, similar to a, 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 the bank holding a title for a car payment, for an auto loan, every commercial loan. In most cases, over $10,000 or so is going to have collateral attached to it, even some smaller than that. So that's understand what collateral means. Collateral is not the money you put into the business. Collateral is something of value that the lender holds a claim against. And the general conditions. I think over the last three or four years, we can all say that, that economic conditions beyond your control may have a very serious impact on your ability to secure financing for a business. Uh, there are a number of examples of businesses that have been able to routinely secure financing for new projects for a number of years that during the recent recession we're just told no, it, just, it just was not going to happen again no matter what. So in many cases, it's not about the business, it's not about you. It's just that here and now isn't the right time. The lenders aren't in a position to take on certain risk, and that's really, really beyond our control. If you're concerned about the credit score being an issue, and again, there's no magic single number, the most common number we hear from lenders is that 650 is going to be a minimum no matter what. That doesn't mean every score of 653 gets funded by any stretch. In practice, obviously, the higher the credit score, the better. Typically, over 700 tends to be far more marketable. But I certainly want to encourage anyone who's planning to submit a request to a bank or commercial lender 
for funding to know your credit score, know what's on your credit report before you submit the request because as soon as you do, they're going to know as well. So you either need to know ahead of time and, and begin to plan you how you're going to address their questions or perhaps knowing the answer gives you some confidence going in. If you know that your score is well in the 750s and you're above a substantial percentage of applicants they see, then you have some confidence. You have a little more leverage in lending relationship. So the, the links here provided the phone numbers for getting a free credit report. One per year from each of the bureaus is, is available through a government program. In order to actually see a credit score, the, the numerical score, the FICO or, or Beacon score requires actually paying for that service. And that's something that you may want to do just on a one-time basis, but not necessarily need to subscribe to on a, for weekly updates, et cetera. Because the question of credit does come up on a regular basis, we provide just a general overview. And again, we're not experts in consumer credit analysis, but just from information published by the Fair Housing Company and some others, just for your information, we've wanted to illustrate that, that when you pay your bills, has a single greatest impact on your credit score. At 35% of your score is weighted in that category. The amount you owe as a percentage of your credit limit, basically how leveraged are you already. If your total, total available credit is $15,000 on all personal loans or credit cards or lines of credit, and your current balance is $14,999, clearly your ability to, to draw more is, is very limited. So that would be viewed as a negative factor. And a number of other categories together comprise about 35%. So the first two there clearly are the most important. To recap some additional sources of capital, we've talked about the commercial loans, bank loans, and some non-bank lender opportunities. But the first in the list, personal savings, personal equity, owner's investment, owner's equity, you hear it called a number of things, is always going to be the first stop. If you're planning to start a business and you have absolutely nothing to invest in it, it's going to be a challenge. We encourage you to look for a plan to you know, address your personal budget first, your household level. What can you do to save something, even a little bit, in the course of the next three to six months, 12 months, so that you would be in a better position to launch the business after that? Family and friends, I sometimes call it family, friends, and fools, is the second category of, of building equity in your business, building some cash reserves, some initial investment into the business. There may be partners. If there's more than one owner in the business, each partner can bring something to the table. We've already talked about touched on loans from banks or other lenders. Business to business lending, business to business finance has been growing moderately in the last few years. There are a number of commercial entities that have opened you know, business lending divisions to make, in order to make loans often to their customers. If you were, you know, and these are typically large you know, Fortune 100 companies that have found that saw you know, financial pressure on their customer base, they had the cash, they had the means to open essentially a, a lending division to help their customers stay current on their bills through the recession and or accruing interest because of it. The factoring and asset-based lending may be an option. Typically, that's not going to be the first option for a very new business, but once you have customers, once you have some financial history, it does become an option. The right-hand column touches on some other, other opportunities. The left-hand typically is or, or debt-based sources, either personal equity or, or debt. The right hand looks at, at equity investment through angel investors who want, in return, a stake in the business. They want some ownership. The small business investment companies are, aren't very prevalent in South Carolina. However, there are, there are a number in the southeast to do place investments in South Carolina. Again, a startup business may not always be their primary target, but it, it's an option. They're looking for a strategic partner or a strategic investor we mentioned partners being a, a potential source of capital. In this case, it may be that there is a, a vendor or a supplier or someone else who has a vested interest in the market you serve. 
that may also be willing to promote the development of your business in order to promote theirs down the road. And venture capital is still an option. Obviously, it looks and feels a little different in South Carolina than it does in Boston or in Texas or in Silicon Valley in California. But, but there are firms out there in the local marketplace who do have an interest in supporting the growth and sustainability of emerging businesses. Very few venture capital firms will look at and seriously consider an equity investment in a true startup business, but it could happen. And to recap a couple of the, of the issues that if your primary concerns are relating to credit score, if that's the first feedback you get from a commercial bank or lender is that you're, you're in that 680 category and while they you know, might want to work with you, they just can't right now, there are strategies to improve your credit score legitimately. It begins by paying off existing debts. If you're already over leveraged, you give yourself a little bit of time and a plan to pay off some existing debts. Increase your savings, your cash reserve. In any case, whether you're pursuing commercial loan, bank investment, or a bank loan, or non bank lender, or even private equity, they say, used to say cash is king. I guess now, in the more political, correct sense, we say cash is regal. So obviously, having some cash of your own gives you leverage to negotiate with anyone else in the business environment. Paying down debt is, very, is often comparable to accruing, building up your personal collateral, the value of assets you bring to the business. It may be paying off equipment that you will use in the business. It may be acquiring extra tools or building equity in, in real estate or another business. At this point, Okay, Scott, this looks like a good place to stop for some questions on this section. Um, let's start with this one. Your presentation starts into financing with loans and investors. But what about grants from the government um, or other private investing companies? Does that really happen? You know, I never feel really comfortable saying that it absolutely never happens. I'm sure in the history of the world it has happened before. However, in recent history, meaning roughly from the, the late 80s, there really we can't find in South Carolina documentation of a business of a private business, privately held for-profit entity, receiving a direct gift or grant from the federal or state government solely for the purpose of starting a new business enterprise. So, while it's hard to say never, it, it just doesn't happen. I've, I'm always on lookout. I, we don't do a lot of research into it because we just don't see it happen. But I do encourage folks who are, are actually looking for, for grant funding sources to let me know when they find something that works. I have seen clients waste a lot of time and money chasing grants rather than taking other efforts to, to build up their business plan, to improve their financial situation directly, to become more eligible and more attractive to the commercial lending sources we see. Okay, well, then that puts us back to uh, to trying to get financing from loans and investors, which uh, brings me to question number two here. When uh, I saw the five C's slide, I got a sinking feeling. If I have a serious weakness in one of those five areas, what are my chances of getting a loan, or is one negative is going to be enough uh, to, to kill my chances. Typically what we see is that a weakness in, in one of those areas, if you can document a, a correlating strength in the other four, one weak area typically is not enough to, to single-handedly put the, the brakes on a deal or a potential loan. And, and there, there are limits to that. Clearly a, a bankruptcy which is more than just bad credit, but a bankruptcy is a, a different category of bad, or a documented loss to the government through another program, such as a student loan or VA loan. Those are going to be complete non-starters. But for the most part, if there's a weakness in collateral or if there isn't quite enough cash inje in injection, quite enough equity investment into the company, or 
one of the er one or two areas are m only moderately strong or adequate. Know the others as well. And if you understand all five areas that are going to be considered by the lender, then the more you can work proactively to address for every negative, point out a strength or two to bring their attention to. So typically, one weak area isn't going to kill a deal from happening. And on the bright side, you know, these are the criteria that commercial lenders operate within, and these are the guidelines that are set by policy for them through their banks or other organizations. You know, private investors often don't have nearly the same concern about a borrower's personal credit history as they do about their management experience and their demonstrated history as an entrepreneur, their experience in the marketplace. So if you're seeking private investment, the five C's don't hold up quite as much, but in the loan environment, that's really that really is key to understand. Understand all five. If you have one that's weak, be able to communicate strengths in the others. Okay. Um, so if there was one most important aspect of a business or plan seeking an, an investor for funding, what would that be? To point out one single most important aspect, I think the single most important aspect is to look like what they're looking for. And that is to say that every angel investment group, every venture capital firm have a target. They have a small box drawn around you know, the marketplace to exclude 95% of potential opportunities so they could focus on just that 3 to 5% that does look like what they're looking for. So clearly if you want to open an online business, an online retail business, find that venture capital firm that has, ex has a history of investing in online retail businesses. If you want to open a brick and mortar distribution facility, find the lender, find the investor who has a history of operating within those industries as well. So the first thing is to to clearly position yourself as a target that looks like what they are looking to invest in. And the second thing, if, if I have a chance to offer as a backup, would be to communicate your experience in the industry, your knowledge of the market, to be able to say that you've been there and done that before goes a long way toward credibility with private investors or venture capitalists. Okay. Um, that's our last question on this segment. Okay. Well, let's move on then to get into some very practical issues with actually getting the business going. As you've worked through the business planning stage, you've researched the market, you've prepared the financial projections, at this point, you're ready to begin to work down that checklist to say, what do I need to do to be in compliance with the rules and regulations of everyone who is going to have a say-so? One of the most common questions we get through the SBDC deals with business licenses. Do I have to have a license for this business? Who do I, where do I go to get that license? And often this comes from individuals or, or business owners who have moved to South Carolina from another part of the country. and the legal structure they're familiar with may be very different. In South Carolina, the local governments have the right to license business, the most local government body, typically the cities and towns, are where you need to go to pursue a business license. And generally speaking, they license the conduct of business within their city limits. In some cases, for example, Greenville County a few years ago began a county-wide business registration system, which isn't truly a license. There's no fee required. It's just a, they're just building a, a database or a registration list of active businesses within the county. But because businesses are licensed by the city, many businesses learn they need to have multiple business licenses if they conduct business in multiple cities across the state. Many of those cities will require a local business license, which pertains just to the business conducted within that city. At the state level, there is a retail sales license. If you provide a tangible good or service, and, it, and there are a handful of services that are included as well, but typically the, the state sales and use tax applies to tangible goods, 
in South Carolina, if you provide that to the end user, to the retail customer, it's your obligation, and there's a, the license basically is the application to create a relationship between your business as a collections agent on behalf of the State Department of Revenue of that sales tax. And you collect that from the retail customer through your, your cash register, your point of sale system. You tabulate those receipts through the, throughout the month and then make a deposit to the Department of, of Revenue. That's a, a one-time license you buy for each facility, each fixed location. In South Carolina, the license costs $50, lasts last forever. And you can find that through the South Carolina Business One Stop or through the SC Department of Revenue website as well. There are a number of other special licensing entities that typically are going to be statewide, which may come from any of a number of different state-level organizations. The Department of Labor Licensing Regulation covers professional licenses, co contractor trade licenses, registration of a number of different occupations from, from medicine to dentistry to chiropractic to, well, the list goes on and on. The Department of Health, DHEC, Department of Health and Environmental Control, partnering with local county health departments, administers the, the retail food permits program, which we all know as the, the restaurant inspection scores that we see stickers for them. So there are a number of others that apply at the state level. And typically, these aren't that hard to find out about. There also may be, if you're looking at a, a commercial location, particularly for businesses based out of the, outside the home or in downtown areas, in historic areas, most often are subject to zoning requirements. And, and if there may not be a specific permit. If you're changing the use of the facility relative to the previous occupant, there may be some zoning changes required. But typically, it's a matter of contacting your local you know, city or county development or zoning board to find out what is the, the appropriate zoning, what uses are eligible. And again, start with the most local entity. Contact the city or town if you're not within the city or town, if you're outside an incorporated area, kind of in the county, as we say. Contact the county planning, zoning, or development board as your, your first stop there. And again, all of these don't apply to any one business but something applies to almost every business. So this definitely is just a process of asking the questions until you get the answers. A number of other considerations. If you will have employees from the beginning, it's very important to be proactive in reporting hires and having a plan for calculating payroll, withholding income taxes, withholding self-employment, withholding the employment taxes. Is this something that you want to do yourself, something that you want to hire a third-party service to do, something that an accountant or bookkeeper or a bank or other entity will do for you. Just having a plan before you get started is really key here. Understanding what kind of taxation is going to be expected of you. Do you are you collecting sales tax from customers? Are you being taxed at the, as the, at the legal entity level, personally, or the business level? What kind of schedule will be in place for, for collection, collection and payment of taxes? Again, zoning I mentioned in the previous slide. If you're in a retail location or a fixed commercial building, understanding the fire codes, OSHA requirements, um, typically the local government, government will issue a certificate of occupancy prior to allowing you to open the building, open a business. For If the public is going to be in a building, often there are limits to how many, how many persons are allowed in a building at one point in time. And just for the general health and safety, fire codes are very important. And they're changing from time to time. So just being aware, communicating with your local building official to be sure that you are, are in compliance. And I've, I've heard it said that it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. That is clearly not the way they operate. And for a reason, when human life and health and safety are involved, it's probably a good thing that the codes are enforced on the front end. If your business is open and you're not in compliance, you will be shut down, and that can become very expensive after the fact. So again, it pays to be proactive, to comply ahead of time, and to know what you're getting into. Again, some of the, some of the licensing or zoning issues or regulatory issues may apply at the city level, some at the county level, some at the state level, and some may be 
uniform at the federal level across the entire country. So it pays to ask questions. Be sure you've done your homework and addressed all four. Now we'll address just a couple of general issues. It's very common in the last five to ten years, the rise of home-based businesses. And the IRS, the, the, national, the federal tax entity, has addressed a number of ways the benefits and the responsibilities for using your home for business use or parts of your home. There are certain standards that must be met regarding the types of what's in, what's in the environment, what's in the room. Is the, is the space used exclusively for, primarily for, or incidentally for business use? And they did take the time to develop a publication, number 587, to use to look into for further reference. A large part of the, our tax code is built around expenses and deductions. Not everything you spend in the course of business is, in fact, a legitimate deduction. So it's important to know going in you know, what are reasonable limits, what are the precedent set, what are the expectations of the IRS concerning gifts and travel and entertainment, food expenses and car, auto expense and cars. Again, here the publication number 463 is a great place to start. And um, again, to say that it's better to know ahead of time what to expect, particularly if you're looking at business with a, a high profit margin and you anticipate the need to, to mitigate your tax liability certainly be advised by professionals and and proceed with caution. And I'll get to a couple of slides that recap a, a checklist for you. And this is something I understand you can go back and review again if you hold on to your passcode. But the first question as you begin to tie the, the research you did in the business planning session to the financial session here, do you see a real opportunity that gives you your product or service in the marketplace a very reasonable, re realistic, very reasonable opportunity to make a profit and to connect with the marketplace? Have you prepared financial projections that are consistent throughout the plan? Often people begin writing a plan, they get through the document, then they stop and begin writing the financial projections and the numbers change. Or they may have a baseline projection, they spend some more market research, they find that the opportunities are much greater. So they write a business plan about a $2 million opportunity, and the financial projections are still looking like a half million dollar opportunity. So it's important that they be consistent before they get to the hands of a potential investor or lender that you take time to step back, proofread closely, and see if you're referencing sales of $2 million in one document that the projections also reflect $2 million in sales, for example. In creating financial projections, obviously you have to make a number of assumptions. Take the time to detail what those assumptions are, where they come from, and document it so that you can communicate that clearly when you're asked. So how do you get the sales of, of X thousand dollars your first month? If your answer with a blank stare and, I don't know, it sounded like a, a good, round, good safe number, that, that doesn't sound like a very credible answer. So if you answer with, I have a letter of intent from three different customers, each one plans to purchase $3,000 within the first 60 days, so we took an average of 1500 over the first month, you know, work through, explain where that number came from, and that's a credible answer. The comment here about considering an exit plan, and many people we work with say, I'm trying to get into business, not out of business, so why are you asking about an exit plan? Well, clearly, I think it reflects the it shows that you've done the research, you've got a backup plan, you understand the reason you're going into business and how and when and why you may want to get out of it. We mentioned the cash inje equity injection in the business to substantiate your ownership share as well. Understanding the, understanding the financial statements that you prepare through the planning process is key. Again, it doesn't require a four-year degree. It doesn't require a master's MBA. Typically just doing your homework, reading what you can, calling an SBDC to ask when you have questions so that you can communicate with confidence and clarity to show that you do have the understanding you need to translate the plan, the ideas, and the numbers into reality in the marketplace 
when the business is funded. Just a little thing here that deals with a, preparing a, a cover sheet, a uh, general summary statement. If you're going to communicate the plan to a potential investor or you've submitted as part of a loan request to a lender, be sure they know how to get in touch with you. Be sure they know how to contact you with their email or phone number to return the documents to you or to follow up should they want to move ahead. At this point, we'll entertain questions from the last session. Okay. Um, let me start with uh, with that uh, IRS publication numbers. Um, where, do, where do I get that information for those publication? Okay. Almost everything published by the IRS is available online. Again, it's a there's a lot of information there. There are search boxes. If you have that publication number, you can just type in publication or pub 487 or 753, whatever the number was, to find that information. Or you can search on business expenses, allowable use of home, just a few keywords. You can find the documentation. And it's virtually all of it's available online and free of charge from the IRS. And there are also a series of small business tax workshops, which are partly supported by the IRS, hosted by SBDCs and other organizations across South Carolina. Probably more than 25 or 30 events each year. I know in the in Greenville County, we typically host four to five local small business tax workshops each year, which includes information from the IRS, from the State Department of Revenue, and the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. And those generally are offered, at, at least in our area, uh, free of charge, and provide tons of great information. And they typically have a number of handouts, takeaways for you from the IRS at that point. Okay, that's good. Um, talk a little bit about licensing requirements. Are they going to be different from city to city? And um, what if the business is going to have locations in multiple cities or even multiple states? Okay, the, the licensing requirements and process may differ a little bit from city to city. Typically, the, the major themes are the same. Each local government will issue a business license pertaining to the conduct of your business within that city and just that city. Often the licenses typically have a, there's a minimum fee. Some smaller towns or smaller cities may just have a, a, a standard fee. A business license will cost $100 no matter what. Others will have a scale, a sliding scale from based on a percentage of gross revenues for the business you conduct within that city. So a business license for the city of Greenville, for example, should not tax your business or, or impose a fee or license fee upon your business based on the volume of business you do in Columbia or another city, for example. However, each local government needs, needs to be asked, needs to be approached. An example of a lawn care service, for example, that may have one customer. Maybe one customer has, it's a bank with 12 locations scattered across 10 different cities that contractor may very well need a business license from every one of those 10 cities to perform the same service for each location for one customer. Again, the, it's not horribly expensive for most businesses. However, it, it is worth looking into just so you know. It can, it can impact your, your cost of doing business, particularly on the startup, at the startup phase. Regarding doing business within two states, that gets a little more complicated. Um, it's not impossible. It happens all the time. However, there are some, some detailed record keeping that's required to, to, to track the, where business is done so that you can allocate income and expenses after the fact to each of the states applied, each of the states that are, that are involved. And again, that's where it really makes sense to have a, a good accountant, a good CPA on your team to help out. I can see that. Uh, uh, in the early planning stages, um, how important is it to address these uh, questions of zoning and licenses? Um, is, is that something that um, I, it's hard to anticipate where my customers are going to be? Um, well, it's, it is difficult to understand the, the hesitance to 
to investigate very thoroughly when you really don't know if you're going to be on one side of town or another or even in the city at all or maybe in the county. A business may choose to locate halfway between two major cities in, in order to serve both rather than being located physically inside one. However, you do need to do just enough research to understand if you do seek a commercial location in the city or outside of a city, what are the reasonable expectations for expenses, for permitting, for zoning, do you have to, and often it's not as much the, the, the dollars expended as the time requirements. In many cases, if a building has to be rezoned, if a property was zoned for a different use than the use you intend, it may require publication of a notice to appeal the zoning, to change the zoning. It may take 60, 90 days, often more in some cases. It may not cost a lot of money again, however, if that sets your, your opening date, your start date back by three months, that can have a serious impact on your on your cash flow, your ability to get the business open and operating with the funds you, you have planned. So it's, it's not always important to get too deep in the detail in terms of exactly what will it cost me, but do enough research to know who the contacts are going to be, who is the city building official, who is, the count, who is your contact, the county planning staff, so that you know when you do as you do address those issues, as you do understand more and more about where you want to locate the business, then you'll have an idea who to contact, how long will it take to, to move ahead, and that, that saves time on the, on, the, on the back end, certainly. Okay, Scott, that was great information, very helpful. Um, but we're going to conclude our Q&A session now in the interest of uh, time. I'd like to remind you that this entire series, Jumpstart Your Business, is available on demand. Please remember to hold on to your passcode so you can go back and review the information later on if you wish. And now before we bring Scott back, I'd like to take a moment to, uh, to introduce you to Portfolio. We are a communication company based in Greenville, South Carolina. We provide communication services, planning, and logistical support for web seminars like this one around the United States. We offer a full slate of communication services ranging from writing, editing, and design, social media support, and media relations. You can find out more about us at www.portfoliosc.com. Now, Scott, back to you for a little more uh, recap and a wrap-up. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Again, just to hit some of the highlights from today's session, that this is important as the business plan itself is, a financial plan to complement the business plan really is critical. It, it is what the world uses, the business world uses to compare opportunities. Anyone you plan to approach as a potential lender or investor in the business needs to be able to understand the scope of the opportunity, and that begins with the basic financial plan. Also, it's a key element of the feasibility study that you go through to understand is it really worth your time and effort and the, the cash, the capital that you tie up to launch a business for the return you can expect. And while no one, very few people want to start a new business, want to go into business for themselves just so they can learn more about accounting, it's important to be able to, to understand the basics, communicate with your accounting professional, with your lender, with your investors and others. On, a, on the basic fundamental level to, so that they understand you know what you're talking about and you understand what's valuable to your business. Again, I can't say enough to understand your numbers. It really is your key to survival. You can, <clears throat> you can get lucky from time to time in business, but those who are truly successful long term, the businesses that, that survive beyond 5, 10 to 15, 20 years are the ones that understand what the financial statements tell them. They've learned to look ahead beyond the current day, the current week, and current month to what's going to happen in, in three months, what's going to happen in the winter or during the summer. Will our business grow? Will it shrink? Will our customers pay us sooner? Will they pay us slower? So understanding the numbers really is critical for long-term success. And in every case, we encourage you to keep it, certainly keep the business legal. <clears throat> the city, county, state, and federal government bodies that, that may or regulate some aspect of the business or may govern the zoning or, or uses of the facility or 
may dictate the safety aspects of the environment where your customers congregate or where your, your employees work really are there to help. They're there with a clear interest in health, health and safety. And it's important to ask, ask beforehand, understand the expectations so that you can meet those requirements to operate the business successfully and safely. At this point, I just want to uh, say again that we're excited to have this three-part series hosted online and available for, for viewing for download. And also want to say I look forward to capturing some additional content in addition to this three-part process about the business plan, the feasibility, the self-study, and the financial plan. We do look forward to others, other seminars and workshops being hosted online and in person through the Small Business Development Center. And for more information, you can always contact us through our statewide website, www.scsbdc.com. Thank you for your time.